This book was so good. No, if you're gonna write about an assassin, they better be assassinating. She even uses the word nonplussed correctly. Perhaps not even gray, just morally black things. At long, long last, I finished Jade War by Fonda Lee. This book was so good. Oh my God. It took me way longer to read than I wanted it to take me and way longer than it should have. If I didn't have a channel, I had no obligations in my life, I would have read this, finished it a much, much sooner. But anyway, I finally managed to finish it and oh, it's so good. It's very, very hard to talk about without spoilers. So I'm gonna do a very brief non-spoiler section here in the beginning. So uh, you can stick around for a little bit longer uh, if you've not read this, uh, but then I'm gonna need to dive into spoilers because one, it's the second book in a series and two, it itself has just so much to unpack about what goes on in it that it would be so, 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 so hard to, to say anything meaningful or or useful or interesting without talking about some of those specifics. So is it worth the hype? Yes, a thousand times yes. Jade City was worth the hype and everyone said Jade War is even better and Jade Legacy will blow your mind. So like I am still, I have not yet read Jade Legacy. I am ready for it to blow my mind. My heart is not ready for it to be broken, but that's going to happen, I'm sure. But Jade War was, was so good. It built so well on top of what Jade City did. Um, it expanded and developed and furthered um, character arcs, plot lines, the world, the magic, the politics, the physical world, not just like knowing more complexly what's going on in the world, but sort of expanding the scope of like where this is taking place, spreading out the characters across the sort of landscape so that we are not just sort of in one place anymore, that it's it's expanded in every way. It did such a good job with those things. It did an amazing job of staying true to characters while allowing them also to grow and change. Some years pass during the course of this book and you can see those characters changing over time, not in a way where they're like completely different from who they were before, but they aren't static, they grow, they change. They are shaped by what happens to them, shaped by the decisions that they make, shaped by who they are uh, in the company of, where they are sent, where they go, who they see, what they experience. This has an effect on them. This has an effect on how they continue then to react to things or how they shift their approach to life or the world or their own views on things. It's done so, so well. It also does an amazing job continuing to keep you on your toes. You know, this is a series where characters can die, where things, you know, it's like reading Game of Thrones, you know, like no one is safe, um, things can go awry. And therefore every scene does feel more intense because unlike a book where everyone has plot armor galore, you do feel more anxiety because you know that this author is capable of doing away with characters, is capable of making terrible things happen to these characters. And is also capable of making these characters do terrible things, which is its own kind of, it's not plot armor necessarily that prevents that in other books, but other authors are uh, hesitant to have characters that are central characters or well-liked characters do things that might make you hate them. And Fonda Lee is not afraid of that at all. Characters in this book will do things that have you questioning why you're reading about them or should you continue to root for them. And when you're writing about such morally great characters in this morally great world, it would be a terrible choice in my opinion as a writer to shy away from doing that. Because if you, if you too much kind of like whitewash and give kind motivations to seemingly violent behavior to all of your main characters, it's, it's then it has the window dressing of a morally gray story without actually being one. Uh, and what makes a morally gray story interesting for those who enjoy those kind of stories is that the characters actually do things that are deeply questionable. If they're not going to, then it's one of those, a lot of YA will do this where like the character is an, an assassin, but they don't actually assassinate anybody. Or if they do, it's always because that person is like basically like fantasy Hitler. And you're like, okay, but like, assassins are a morally gray interesting thing because they go around killing people for money and your character that you're telling me is an assassin maybe they did that off screen <laughs> maybe but really they're not you know you're afraid that we wouldn't like them if they actually assassinated people because like that's bad no if you're gonna write about an assassin they better be assassinating <laughs> so here well while what they do is condoned by the law nevertheless the setup and feel of these books is that it's about gangsters that it's about mob it's about the mafia it's about yakuza-esque um setups even though, I mean, in this world, it is sanctioned by the government what they do, but they operate the way that you see Peaky Blinders, The Godfather, Sons of Anarchy. To shy away from having those characters do morally great things would be a mistake. And it is not a mistake that Fonda Lee makes. She makes the characters 
make tough calls and do difficult things. Um, and it makes it such a rich book um, with so much for you as the reader to experience and feel because when something's happening bad to a character that you're rooting for, you know, your heart's thudding because you know that this could end badly, there is very little plot armor. And if a character that you like is doing something bad, your heart is thudding because you're like, oh, are they they're really gonna do that? Oh my god, they're really gonna do that? Oh, that's, I don't know how I feel about that. So the, it is a rich emotional experience reading these books because she gives it all to you. Stuff that's tragic, stuff that's tough, stuff that's horrifying, stuff that's uh, exciting and thrilling, stuff that's good as well. Sometimes good things happen and that's exciting as well. So overall just I can't say enough great things about it. I can't think of a single criticism for it. Uh, she even uses the word nonplus correctly which if you know me at all uh, that's something that irritates the piss out of me when people use nonplus incorrectly. So basically I, like I said I can't think of a single bad negative thing to say about this. The only negatives about it would be things like if this is not to your taste. This is the kind of book where there's some books where I'm like I find it difficult to believe that that there are many people that wouldn't like this because it has such broad mass appeal. This isn't like that. I mean, if you're, it is really morally gray. It is quite violent. It, it's highly political. So if those are things that don't appeal to you, like I can absolutely get why this wouldn't be your cup of tea. But if it is your cup of tea, if that's the type of story that you like, then this is some of the best there is out there. Um, so if you like a gangster story, if you like a morally gray story, if you like a highly political story, um, this, this is fantastic. This is about as good as it gets, so. Definitely, definitely recommend the series so far. And I can't imagine Jade Legacy will fumble the landing after everything that I've heard about it. So spoilers, this is your final warning. If you've not read Jade War, we're doing spoilers now. So for me, I read this book kind of half and half. I read uh, a good 50% of it a couple months ago and now I read the other half of it basically. So it does feel to me like I read two books, like some of the beginning of it, like I, I forget, like it doesn't feel like that happened in the same book. And when I realize and I remind myself that no, that all took place in Jade War. There's so much that happens in Jade War. So one of the most uh, morally gray things that happens probably in the entire book, I don't know, you know, mileage may vary, you might think something else is worse, but one of the most morally gray things, um, perhaps not even gray, just morally black things <laughs> that happens in this book is Hilo, the fan favorite, killing his dead brother's wife and taking the child taking his nephew. I had a really long conversation about this um, with Hillary from Bookborn. She was ahead of me. We were ostensibly buddy reading it and then, you know, she finished it and I didn't. This scene happens, I believe it's chapter 21, but let's say that if it's not, let's say that it is. It's somewhere thereabouts. So she was like, have you gotten to chapter 21 yet? And I was like, no, I haven't. And then I made some progress. She's like, have you read chapter 21 and not told me? I was like, you will be the first to know when I've read chapter 21. So I did finally read chapter 21 and I was like, well, <laughs> Um, so that was a lot. I can see why you were like, have you read this chapter? Because of the way that that happens and because of the way that I found myself I uh, basically victim blaming. Because I, I want to be clear, I was not defending Hilo's behavior. I was not defending what Hilo chose to do. If we can even say chose to because it was pretty reactive and instinctual what he did. Like I don't think that if he had like sat down to plan what he was going to do, I don't think he planned to do that. But nevertheless, he did do it. But that said, like reading that scene and everything that leads up to it, I was like, you know, not to victim blame, but I am about to victim blame. There's so many choices made by uh, his sister-in-law, who he kills, that I'm like, lady, like it's not, what Hilo does is, is not fine. Absolutely uh, upfront we agree, what Hilo does is not fine. That is, that is a crime, uh, both like morally and legally, like that's, in no way is that okay for that he did that. But that being said, you kind of a little bit brought this upon yourself <laughs> because it's not like she doesn't know what Hilo's like. It's not like she doesn't know what Green Bones are like. It's not like she doesn't know what the No Peak clan is like. She knows exactly what Hilo is like and she knows what the clan is like. She knows what Green Bone life is like. She has said that this is the very reason that she wants to keep her, herself and her son away from all of that. So that being the case, her knowing full well what they, how they behave, how they think, and how they react to things. The fact that she specifically thinks that Hilo is worse than all of them. That like this lifestyle in general is bad, but that Hilo more than most is just like a violent monster that reacts with violence at all times. And the things that she does to seemingly intentionally provoke him. I'm like, it's not like you didn't know he was like this. You're telling us that that's why you don't like him. You're telling us this is why you don't want your kid around this because he is like this. So why are you provoking him? 
you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, you provoked him, therefore you deserve to die. You don't deserve to die. What he did is wrong. It is wrong 100%. But knowingly provoking someone that you are calling a violent monster, like, you know that can't end well, right? Like, you, you, you know you're kind of asking for it, right? Like, you, you shouldn't be dead. That's wrong. And Hilo is wrong to have done that. But like, what, what did you expect? Like, what did you think was going to happen when you did that? When you, you know, you know what I'm saying? So like, again, to be absolutely a thousand percent clear, Hilo killing her is wrong. She should not be dead. But she didn't help herself any in all of the things that she was saying to him, that she was disclosing, that she, the way that she was reacting and behaving. I was like, this really could only have ended that way. And even you yourself should have seen that coming from what you said he's like. Like, you know this, like, why are you doing this? <laughs> like they're gonna, uh, it's been a minute now cause I did read the first half uh, longer ago, but I believe they agreed to have dinner to discuss, you know, some kind of like arrangement where the kid can visit with his family in Kekon. And she, she agrees to do a dinner like that. But so before the dinner happens, she's now gonna like run away with the kid before that dinner is even able to happen. And I'm like, why? Why would you do that? You know he's gonna come looking for you. You know he's gonna be pissed off. And you know he's gonna be like livid that you're trying to trick him and now like take the, the kid away that he wanted to see. It's not his right to have the kid. It's not his right to have the kid visit, but you know that he feels that it is and you have agreed to have dinner with him. So just go have dinner, do the dinner. And then after the dinner, you can agree to whatever. You can say, yeah, sure, we'll do visitation. We'll work it out. And after you've worked it out, then leave. You don't need to leave before the dinner happens. That's stupid. <laughs> You're asking to piss him off. You're asking for him to lash out. And then when he does find out, everything that he says, that she says to him when he shows up and is like, what the heck? Um, everything that she says, she's like, yes, I'm running away and you're a monster. And you're like, I forget exactly what she says because it's been a minute, but like, she's just like provoking him. And I'm like, do you want to die? Like, this is a terrible idea. What are you doing? Stop it. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, what Hilo does makes it very hard to, um, continue to root for Hilo, but you know, you know what she signed up for. So it is what it is now that we've, that we move past that. And you know, Hilo does uh, you know, he just he takes good care of his nephew and treats him like one of his own. And uh, for the kid him, himself, like, I'm guessing there's going to, it's like, you know, that's Chekhov's family drama right there. Like, you know, the kid is going to find out what Hilo did and, and how that all went down. It's going to come back to bite him. There's no way that doesn't. But for now, Hilo is a good dad to him and he's raising the kid. Um, perhaps, you know, the mom didn't want him raised in the greenboat life. But if he is to be raised in the greenboat life, he's being raised very well with a lot of care and a lot of love and a lot of family around. And the kid is okay all things considered. But anyway, that was that was quite a quite an opener, not actual opener. Obviously, it's not like the first chapter, but quite a way to start Jade War. And then many moral gray, morally gray decisions later, when we have the end where I was ready to be mad, and then I wasn't. Um, but I was upset. This is it's a very weird state of emotions. <laughs> this book just makes you feel kind of weird things. So at the end, when Wen, the stone eye, is able to get the revenge that she wanted on the person that killed her brother, um, she was not willing to wait. Um, she was impatient and she wasn't gonna let this chance slip by. So she's gonna take the vengeance that has that it that it's able that she's able to take. And she succeeds, she kills the guy. And then when they're ambushed by these other criminals and they're all getting like suffocated and choked and killed. I was like, so this is, I'm guessing when's going to die because this is her sort of the, the, she got her revenge. She did it, but this is the, the punishment for having been impatient for just taking the revenge instead of waiting when there was maybe a better opportunity. This is, you know, that's coming to back to bite her in the ass. She's going to die now. Uh, she doesn't die. So for a second I was like, Oh, fake out death, resurrection trope. Like, that's not something that I was expecting to see from Fonda Lee, but that scene forced Andon to use Jade again, which I knew at some point, something like that would have to happen. So I like the way that that happened and the way that he was like, I'd used Jade to kill before, but experiencing what it's like to use it to heal makes me want to use it again. So I liked that. But when he, um, when he managed to revive when, and he was like, it had been a few minutes, but he finally got blood pumping again. In my head, I was like, well, if this was in a fiction book, they should probably have brain damage, but you know, she'll be fine. And then she did have brain damage, which is like such a weird thing to say with a delighted smile. <laughs> so 
I was, um, it's a weird thing to say. I was relieved that she had brain damage. Um, but you know what I mean? I was like, okay, I'm relieved that Fonda Lee made it, you know, realistic in a world with magical rocks that make you have superpowers. That yeah, that there, there are consequences. It's not like you can be basically clinically dead and then for several minutes and be revived and not have, and, and be like totally fine. She does have brain damage. So yeah, for the next book, I'm guessing there's going to be some kind of repercussions or Nico, uh, Lan's son, who Hilo, who Hilo killed his mom and stole him away. I'm guessing there will be, that will be found out and it will cause problems. I'm guessing the fact that Hilo's own son is a stone eye will cause problems. Um, not for Hilo personally and how he views his son, but this will create problems. <laughs> it will. So the fact that Wen is now paralyzed, um, at least as far as we know that she's uh, paralyzed, that how this is going to affect her and Hilo's relationship and affect her ability to help the clan and her place in the clan and in being back is going to create both opportunities and problems. There's just, there's just so much. Uh, she's like continued to complicate all these threads that she put in place before. And there's just so much to resolve and also so many different ways this can go and so many new, so many fresh horrors that can be visited upon uh, the characters and by extension, the readers. It's so well done. It's so well done. And I am hyped to read Jade Legacy and be broken. <laughs> so let me know in the comments down below. Hopefully uh, if you're at this point in the video, you've read Jade War. Um, maybe you've read Jade Legacy, no spoilers. We can talk spoilers about Jade Legacy when I finish it. But yeah, let me know your thoughts about Jade City, Jade War, Greenbone in general, whatever you let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times will be up on Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.